What you doing? <laughs> Good. I love doing that. I don't know if you're on camera or not, or not though. Are we? Are you rolling? Uh -huh. Oh, all right. We'll have to cut this part out, I guess. Okay. All right. Well, thanks you guys for coming. Well, no, for you, if you don't know, we're in a series on the book of Isaiah, which I'm sure most of you are aware, and probably at some level while you're here. The um, is a long-term series. We're still clocking it through. It's going to end on the Sunday after Labor Day. And I think we're down to like four more after this, and so we can kind of see the end of this thing. So if you guys are, are, are hanging tough with this thing, I appreciate it. And once again, if you're reading through the book of Isaiah, I'm giving you reading assignments all the way along, and you will have read the whole thing from cover to cover every single verse. So here we go with uh, the series called Return to Sender where a prophetic postman delivers a messianic message with God's stamp of approval to a world gone postal. We're in what I'm calling the 15th letter from, uh, from this book, from chapter 54, verse 1 to 56, verse 8. So you can turn to Isaiah chapter 54 if you want to now. We'll, I'll catch up with you in a little bit. This particular letter, number 15, is entitled Forwarding Address. And again, male analogies run rampant throughout this whole series. I've dredged up every single one I can think of and inserted them somewhere. Isaiah last week has just finished belting out the last of his four servant songs. That's what most scholars and commentators have allocated these particular verses that are extremely prophetic and messianic in their prophecies. The first one was found in chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. The second song was, was in chapter 49, verses 1 to 7. The third song was chapter 50, verses 4 to 11. And the final song was chapter 52, verse 13 to 53, verse 12. We did the last three songs uh, last week. There is a little bit of discrepancy. If you guys are going to hold me, hold my feet to the fire and look at this stuff. Um, there, are, there is some wiggle room about when these servant songs stop and start. It's just a verse or two. It's not crucial. But I've noticed that certain people allocate them differently. I just gave you the chapter, the Bible headings in this New, New Living Translation, and that's typically how they fall, but sometimes people take a little liberties and change the verses a little bit. But there are four prophetic servant songs in the book of Isaiah. So now, Isaiah comments on what has been revealed of this suffering servant. In particular, what exactly the servant has done with the consequences of his sacrificial death. Well, for one, universal salvation has, in fact, been achieved to those who receive Christ as their personal Savior. So that's a done deal. The servant has finished his work on earth. He's paid mankind's purchase price and is now at work in heaven interceding for God's people. So here's the first question. So what difference does it make that he endured all of that suffering? So what's the big deal? Aside from the grisly pain and all of that, what's it all about? Well, for Israel, it means restoration. So now they have a new invite as a result of that open door as per the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. For the Gentiles, it means an invitation. That means we, the grafted-in ones, actually get an invitation to be a part of this whole camaraderie that first started with the Israelites. And for rebellious sinners, and yes, we are some, uh, it means accusation. And I'm going to spare you that, because uh, we're going to talk about that in letter number 16, which is called Pushing the Envelope. So we're going to start with the restoration. So here's the headline from Jerusalem's Temple Tribune, circa 690 B.C. God, the faithful husband, forgives Israel his unfaithful wife. God, the faithful husband, forgives Israel his unfaithful wife. The story goes on, underneath the headline, she, who was once married to God on Mount Sinai, has committed adultery by turning to other gods. As such, God, the loving husband, had to abandon her temporarily so that she could see what it was like to live in a land where people worshipped <laughs> false gods. So, if you haven't already, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah 54. And we'll begin in verse 4. And I'm in the New Living Translation, as I mentioned. Isaiah 54, verse 4. Fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There is no more disgrace for you. 
You, are, you will no longer remember the shame of your youth and the sorrows of widowhood, for your creator will be your husband. The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. He is your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you back from your grief as though you were a young wife abandoned by her husband, says the Lord. For a brief moment I abandon you, but with great compassion I will take you back. God's children of Israel had been called back from grief, so says Isaiah. Their previous behavior of shameful youth and disgrace has now been completely and totally forgiven and generously forgotten. True, there was a brief moment, a burst of anger, if you will, when God had abandoned them, but like Noah's flood, that won't happen again. Why? Because Israel, like us, are once again forgiven by the great compassion and steadfast love of our Redeemer-husband, who did not give up on us and who sent his son to get us back. And so he did. Now God's merciful everlasting covenant will withstand the moving mountains and the disappearing hills of life's changes, Isaiah 54, 10. And as you well know, just by living another week, there's undulations all the time underneath your feet in this life on planet Earth. God, the faithful, loving husband, restores Israel to a place of blessing. All with the promise that she will be fully restored when the Messiah comes and establishes his kingdom. So, second question. So what's with this new kingdom in which we've been fully restored to him? What's with it? We get to live in it, apparently, but so what's it like? Well, look at verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 54. Sing, O childless woman, you who have never given birth. Break into loud and joyful song, O Jerusalem, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband, says the Lord. Enlarge your house, build an addition, spread out your home, and spare no expense. For you will soon be bursting at the seams. Your descendants will occupy other nations and resettle the ruined cities. First of all, this new kingdom is a place of joy and singing, Isaiah 54, 1. And Isaiah should know, after all, he mentions songs and singing more than 30 times in this particular book that bears his name. It will be a great place, fruitful expansion as the nation increases and even needs more space. House remodels going on up and down the block as even barren folks prepare for the arrival of even more children. Once only a diminished remnant because of that Babylonian invasion that did gut them, the Lord will do for the nation what he did for Abraham and Sarah. Tents will be enlarged and desolate cities inhabited again. The remnant is returning to Jerusalem with all those children. Isaiah 49, 19 to 21. A population explosion that will even scale the walls of the ancient city and spill out into the, the adjacent vacant ghost towns and even other occupied nations. Other nations that Israel will command as well. But who would want to leave the holy city? A once storm-battered, troubled, and desolate city, Jerusalem, is now rebuilt with precious jewels on a foundation of deep blue rock, Towers of rubies surrounded by a wall made from all manner of precious stones into which is placed a welcoming gate of shining gems. And within its walls of this newly rebuilt holy city of Jerusalem is confidence. Confidence, not only in the steadfast love of the Lord, but also on his dependable promises. They have returned to their land where their beloved holy city is being rebuilt. Historically, the returning remnant rebuilt the temple and the city under the leadership of Zerubbabel, the governor, <laughs> Joshua the high priest, Ezra the scribe, Nehemiah the wall builder, and the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. But get this, the rebuilt Jerusalem is nothing like what Isaiah describes, not the historical one. Looking ahead, he is envisioning the return of the Lord and the establishment of his kingdom, where every citizen of Jerusalem will know God's goodness in a city free from terror and free from war. 
which is another reason for our confidence. It is a place where the people actually fear not. Secure under a government that is just and fair. Sit on that one for a minute. Secure under a government that is just and fair, unto which people will come running to obey, to a place where their enemies stay far away, banishing the very thought of doing wrong. And if they do try to pick a fight, as in the glory days of King David, on display will be God's sovereign, mighty power, and they will lose badly. Isaiah 54, 15. Look at Isaiah 54, verse 14. You will be secure under a government that is just and fair. Your enemies will stay far away. You will live in peace, and terror will not come near. If any nation comes to fight you, it is not because I sent them. Whoever attacks you will go down in defeat. The Creator begins all things, maintains them, controls them in operation and guides them to the destiny he appoints. If this great God of ours were only at work in the nice things, how grim would our plight be in this menacing world? But he is at work and in full operational control of all things. In the Creator's world, we are a protected species. In a planned environment and destined for a glorious future that is already ours. Teach your children this truth, and they too will enjoy great peace. Isaiah 55, 13. What truth? interrupted Mrs. I, who had once again resumed her curious over-the-shoulder position behind her writer husband in, at the dining room table. She had just begun her looming, so without any context, her eyes had grabbed the last sentence her husband had scrawled on the parchment, and her mouth held it up to the light for further examination. The new improved Jerusalem, her husband said, with a slump of his shoulders, part fatigue and part spousal exasperation. But he checked himself, and he helpfully resumed. It will be like nothing we have ever seen before. Trying to invoke a bit of zeal that the future facts certainly warranted. But Mrs. I was thinking distractedly about this truth, and whether they had properly taught their two boys everything. The essentials. Not just some holy city reconstruction project. No matter how bad the place needed a facelift, the boys were almost out of the house. And time was running out. I would love to see it, the coming kingdom, Mr. I remarked, with bucket list wistfulness. The fact that this would involve significant time travel did not seem to thwart his wanderlust longings. This wasn't fanciful pie in the sky. It was the distant ticking of a great clock tower. <clears throat> you need to get out more was all his wife could say, a bit on the goading side, but she was back to the conversation at hand. Instead of going on the defensive, Mr. I simply nodded in guilty acquiescence. We should have done what my parents did when the boys were younger. What's that? asked Mrs. I, although she knew the answer from the repeat performances when her husband felt tied down and provincial in spite of their long-term roots in a bustling capital city. Travel more! said her husband, a little too forcibly from the claustrophobia, as if his enthusiastic answer was glaringly obvious. If it wasn't for my calling in this book, he said, with a dejected self-pity as he waved his hand over the pile of vellum, quills, and scrolls. He was thinking of his late father Amos and his mother, who right after Isaiah had moved out of the house, had recklessly bought a prehistoric stone-wheeled conveyance called a mobile home, <laughs> predating the Flintstones by over 2,700 years and pulled by a six-member team of bull-headed oxen, all bought and paid for by an inheritance from their distant relative, the late King Amaziah. Isaiah thought this a rash and random purchase by his retired parents, but off they went. Understandably, travel was slow going, and they were gone for large chunks of the Jewish calendar. But see the world, they did. Hiking to the summit of Mount Carmel, swimming or floating in the salty Dead Sea, 
hot wind in their faces during a camel ride in the eastern desert, leaving no stone unturned while searching through the fallen rubble from the original walls of Jericho. When Isaiah had married Mrs. I, and as their two boys were growing up, his parents always carved out large blocks of time to visit their grandchildren, parking their rickety mobile home in the I's Jerusalem driveway for periods too prolonged to measure. Many a morning, Mr. I had been woken up by the sound of loud chewing outside by the tired team of motley oxen grazing on the high grass right underneath his bedroom window. Suddenly, his calling in his book didn't look so bad. He needed no further personal distinction. The gift of revealed truth has always marked off the Lord's people from all others. Look at Isaiah 54, verse 16. I have created the blacksmith who fans the coals beneath the forge and makes the weapons of destruction. And I have created the armies that destroy. But in that coming day, no weapon turned against you will succeed. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. Their vindication will come from me. I, the Lord, have spoken. In the old days, Isaiah is hearkening back to, the, black, the blacksmith's forge was humming with activity. But when it did, it portended something. Hammers were banging, metal was scraping, Bellows were blowing, fires were roaring it, but it was all the sounds concomitant, there's a three dollar word, with upcoming war. But now, no weapon will be turned against you, no voice raised to accuse you. The servants of a vindicating Lord will enjoy his benefits of silence. In short, the new coming kingdom, according to Isaiah, is one, a place of music, <coughs> Isaiah 54, 1, and two, a place of silence, Isaiah 54, 17. Two things with which the devil has a very, very hard time. Just ask C.S. Lewis's demon, Uncle Screwtape, in one of his many letters to nephew Wormwood. Music and silence, how I detest them both. How thankful we should be that ever since our father entered hell, no square inch of infernal space and no amount of infernal time has been surrendered to, to either of those abominable forces. But all has been occupied by noise. Noise, the grand dynamism, the audible expression of all that is exultant, ruthless, and virile, Noise, which alone defends us from silly qualms and despairing scruples and impossible desires. We will make the whole universe a noise in the end. We've already made great strides in this direction as regards the earth. The melodies and silences of heaven will be shouted down in the end. But I admit, we're not yet loud enough or anything like it. But silence even before God, is not necessarily helpful. It depends on what we are doing with it. What are we doing with this silence? Where are our minds at? Left to themselves, they flit hither and yawn, even more so in the middle of the night, and they just <laughs> add to our restlessness. All the more reason that we should respond with our ears wide open, Isaiah 55, 3, to the invitation. And here it is, Isaiah 55, verse 1. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does, that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. The suffering servant did not died just for the sins of Israel. He died for the whole world. The Gentiles are included in God's plan. That said, believing <laughs> Jews and Gentiles will one day be united in Jesus Christ, who is living water and the bread of life. And by the way, folks, he does not abdicate that title or those titles when we all get into <laughs> eternity. He's living water. He's the bread of life. 
if we would only change our eating and drinking habits, which is really what's at issue here. Or, better put, our wicked ways. Chapter 55, verse 7. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God and he will forgive generously. The words here in the New Living Translation, let them change, banish, turn. These are words of true repentance as only the Old Testament can render them. Uh, they're forceful, they're strong. But note this. The sequence and the prepositions need to be reversed lest we fall into the trap of some misconception. Hear me now. It's not turning from and then turning to. The Bible's not about that. It is turning to God from idols in that order. 1 Thessalonians 9, verse 1. To God first, from God, from idols afterwards. And we must do it in that order every hour of every single day. The musical phrase would be, come just as you are. To that end, God will use a glorious Israel to call the Gentiles to salvation by the power of his word. Look at verse 10, chapter 55. The rain and the snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always, 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 always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to do, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. No one loves the word of God more than the God whose word it is. Start there. No one loves the word of God more than the God whose word it is. That's why we honor it, protect it, read it, and teach it as accurately as possible. And the word is out. The new Jerusalem will be the center of worship in the world. When God delivered his people from Babylon and took them safely back to their own land. Miracle of miracles. It was and still is a witness of God's power and his love to the nation. It still is a witness to that historical fact, including those of us right here and now in the United States of America who bear witness to this historical miracle by playing God's rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> and it's a completed version for all of you who have been sticking with us. So everybody, here we go. These are the three historical epochs that occur in the book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters. The first one he lived through, the second and the third are prophetic. But here's what happened during the lifetime or the scope of the book of Isaiah. Assyria crushes northern Israel. Babylon smothers Assyria and southern Judah. Cyrus cuts up Babylon and cuts loose Israel. There you go. A complete handle on the 55-year career of the prophet Isaiah. One more time for the sake of retention. Assyria crushes northern Israel. Babylon smothers Assyria and southern Judah. Cyrus cuts up Babylon and cuts loose Israel. Look at 55 verse 12. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. They will be an everlasting sign to his power and his love. There is great joy and peace bestowed upon the exiles, and they're called to be released from both their inner and outer forms of captivity, which we talked about last week. And when they share in that glorious exodus at the end of the age and return to their land, not only the, the mountains, but the hills truly are alive with the sound of music. And this time they are accompanied by enthusiastic hand clapping from the fields of trees. It is typical of the Bible to represent responding to the Lord as coming to a party. And what a party it will be. A call to worship for us all. It's found in chapter 56, verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Be just and fair to all. Do what is right and good, for I am coming soon to rescue you. 
and to display my righteousness among you. Blessed are all those who are careful to do this. Blessed are those who honor my Sabbath days, my Sabbath days of rest, and keep themselves from doing wrong. Now this is interesting as the chapter goes on. The blessed are not only the outcasts of Israel, and even us grafted in much later, Isaiah 56, 8, but also the very people God prohibited way back when from entering his covenant kingdom of rest in the first place. Namely, these were the two people groups that were on the hit list, foreigners and eunuchs, and not just from Ethiopia. Deuteronomy 23, verses 1 to 8. Now, foreigners and eunuchs and the like of all manner of reprobate, sinners, the lost, those who commit themselves, the Hebrew here is actually the word laba, which means to join in or to be joined, those who are joined in and who serve and love his name, committing their whole lives and choosing to do what pleases him, and not just on Sundays. There's the warning. Sadly, though, as most of you might know, or surmise throughout the pages of the unfolding Old Testament, dramatic as it is, God's admonition to repent and the remnant to be just and fair to all and to do right what is right and good, here's a newsflash, was not obeyed. Just ask Ezra the scribe, Nehemiah the wall builder, and the prophets Haggai and Malachi over the next 200 years years. The people all too soon forgot God's goodness to them, past, present, and future. They forgot who they were, where they had been, and where they were going. They had returned to their own ways, their earthly routines. So here's the question. Have you? That is not just an Israelite malady. That is a human race illness. This leads us to a present-day challenge, which I leave you with today, which has attached to it a precaution. Turn back to Isaiah 55, verse 8, a passage I deliberately skipped. 55, verse 8. My thoughts are not like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So get this. The Lord is thinking his own thoughts, and he's pursuing his own road when he meets our moral and spiritual need. Wow. Do you ever, you know, as a kid, put a penny on a railroad track and watch that diesel locomotive go over? I'll say this again. The Lord is thinking his own thoughts and pursuing his own road when he meets our moral and spiritual need. And here's where the precaution comes in because we've got audacity that is just profound sometimes. As long as we first insist that everything about God's ways and his plans be made completely intelligible to us before we decide to act on his invitation. As long as you and I insist on that, we will never act, ever. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And if we continue with that prerequisite to coming to Christ, oh, no, no, I've got to have all the answers here. I've got to know, what are you going to do? It's like, you're a penny on a railroad track. Stop it. Trust me. If you, if you proceed down this road, or this track, as it were, you will not act. You will be no earthly good, but we must act. And here's how we must act. We must act like where we are going. As a result, we will leave a forwarding address from which everyone we encounter must consider for their own good or ill. We must not be like the children of Israel who acted like there was no such thing as a promised land. And we find that creeping in every single day we wake up in real life, as C.S. Lewis described it. 
never be like the children of Israel, who acted like there was no such thing as a promised land. So I just thought for fun, I would give you a recap so that we can hammer home this point once and for all, hopefully, a recap of the Israelites' not-so-excellent exodus. It's not the ten plagues of Egypt I'm after, but the ten plagues from God's chosen people. Here we go. A young Moses was innocently taking a walk around the busy construction site outside his Egyptian palace, when yet another mon where yet another monument to either a monarch or a god, or both, was being erected on the breaking backs of his very own Hebrew people. He noticed an overseeing and overbearing Egyptian boss beating up on one of the exhausted, emaciated Hebrew workers. Looking both ways to make sure the coast was clear, Mo killed the Egyptian in cold blood and quickly buried him in the sand. The next day, it was two Hebrews going at it fist cuffs. He asked why, to which both of them loosened their grips on each other and said, Who appointed you to be our judge and prince? One pointed to the mound of dirt nearby, strangely bearing the dimensions of a large middle-aged man. Are you going to kill me like you did him? Such was Moses' first encounter with his sweet and loving native people. Years later, burned by bushes, snakes, and sticks, and with God's business card in his pocket, Moses drags his brother with him to pay a visit to Pharaoh, which does not go well. As a result, Hebrew slave labor just got heavier and sweatier. The Israelite foreman caught up with Moses and gave him a piece of his mind. May the Lord judge and punish you. You make us stink to high heaven before Pharaoh and his officials, and you don't smell so good yourself. Such was Moses' second encounter with his sweet and loving native people. Moses took it out on God, who told him to wake up and smell the milk and honey, which Moses tried to avoid like the plague. After the tenth one produced a very high body count, the Israelites were free to go. With God's pillar of fire and cloud as their tour guides, they skedaddled to the Red Sea shores, only to look over their shoulders at an Egyptian posse coming after them. They screamed at Moses, a collected, We told you so! Telling him to get lost, that they would take their chances with the Egyptians. Such was Moses' third encounter with his sweet and loving native. Even after rearranging seas, the bitter people whined about equally bitter water. Hearing the complaints around the water cooler, stick in the mud, Moses put one in the pond, and the watering hole became whole. Such was Moses' fourth encounter with his sweet and loving native people. Shortly thereafter, their stomachs started to growl, and so did they. The divine chef, Chief Fire and Cloud, whipped up some wafers and warblers, making the people fat and sassy, until they got bored. Such was Moses' fifth encounter with his sweet and loving native people. More thirst, more threats. Moses struck a nearby rock, just missing their heads, <laughs> drowning their argument, at least for now. <coughs> Such was Moses' sixth encounter with his sweet and loving native people. Overwhelmed with their petty disputes that had to be farmed out to middle managers, their reluctant leader climbs a mountain, to borrow the rules of the road book from the Sinai not-so-public library. While his charges down below get impatient waiting and resort to both jewel, jewelry, jewelry rustling and cattle worshiping, Moses throws the book at him, killing 3,000, and God adds an 11th plague. Such was Moses' seventh encounter with his sweet and loving native people. More complaining this time about hardship in general. And this time, God gets in on the action from his little gold box and incinerates everyone complaining in the back seat, are we there yet? <laughs> Such was Moses' eighth encounter with his sweet and loving native people. While his own brother and sister are complaining in his ear, 12 spies go out to assess the milk and honey land. 10 think it's too big, and the people flip a lid while God blows a gasket for the next 40 years. Such was Moses' ninth encounter with his sweet and loving native people. His dead sister's body not even cold in the ground when there's more complaining. Once again about the lack of water, Moses is instructed to talk softly and carry a big stick. Instead, Moses talks loudly and whacks the stick with a rock <laughs> against a rock. Water pours out anyway, but Moses' promised land ticket is revoked in exchange for a trip up Mount Nebo. 
for a bird's eye view of what might have been had it not been for the tenth and final counter with his sweet and loving native people. Stuck smack dab in the middle of all this havoc wreaking and law giving, Moses is instructed to build a tent for the Lord to travel in. A tabernacle, as the Old Testament describes it. Both the noun and the verb. Yahweh actually localizing himself with an earthly address. With those people? Wow. And this has always been his preference. 2 Samuel 7, verses 6 to 7. Our churches are places, traditionally, that we go to be with him. His house, on the other hand, was a place he came in order to be with us. We might call it God's mobile home. <laughs> Always free to move about, to be with, and to lead, guide, protect, and direct his people. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. I love your sanctuary, Lord, the place where your glorious presence dwells. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. Isaiah 55, 6. As such, we are to move right along with him through all of the hills and valleys of life, taking full advantage of not only this age of grace which we find ourselves in, but also our own individual season of finding, Psalm 32, 6. And find him we shall every time we act like where we are going and leave a forwarding address that can clearly be followed <laughs> by others as we follow God's mobile home. You know the one. It's the one with the bumper sticker slapped on the back that says, My kingdom come. That's your new address. Your kingdom go. That's your old address. Traveling with him anywhere and everywhere down the level path of Isaiah's raised highway of holiness all the way to his coming kingdom where finally my faith will be sight. Speaking of sight, Isaiah ends his 15th letter to us with a P.S. that repeats a line from chapter 55, verse 6, and then asks us all to look out the window. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Is that a mobile home parked in your driveway? <laughs> Next time... After we open some fan mail, we will look at Isaiah chapter 56, verse 9, to chapter 59, verse 21, and what the prophet thinks about those leaders all around us who remain sinful, and who constantly push the envelope by worshiping anything that comes along, anything that is but the one true God. And that's when push comes to show. Let's close the prayer. Father, again, we just are so grateful for the, the profundity that is in this book, and particularly in this, in this passage. Thank you so much that you are near us and that you are, are with us, and you desire to be so. You desire to be on wheels, as it were, so that you could be right alongside us, guiding us, directing us, changing our direction as need be, but <coughs> always making sure that we... Know that your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. You didn't just get sidelined and distracted and therefore saved us on the fly. You were this roaring freight train and we were the penny on our railroad track and we jumped on and joined the party. That's how this works. <coughs> we thank you for the reminder that that is. We just pray that uh, the mobile home parked in front of all our driveways would get our undivided attention so that we would constantly be aware and to act accordingly, act like where we are going and glorify you in the process and be an infectious, compelling witness for you as a result of that perspective that we should never let go of. Thank you so much that your son is driving the mobile home, the author and perfecter of our faith. We give our lives to you. 
all of our idiosyncrasies, our habits, our issues, everything that bogs us down and makes us want to just live our life as a routine on planet Earth, which you will have nothing to do with. I just pray that you help us to yield, to surrender, and to be more like your son, the wild and crazy driver of that mobile home, every single day this week ahead. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 See you next week.